Chapter 31 The inn at Wensley Village was full of music and laughter and noise. Will sat at a table with Horace, Alice and Jenny, while the innkeeper plied them with a succulent dinner of roast goose and farm fresh vegetables, followed by a delicious blueberry pie whose flaky pastry won even Jenny's approval. It had been Horace's idea to celebrate Will's return to Castle Redmond with a feast. The two girls had agreed immediately, eager for a break in their day-to-day -day lives, which now seemed rather humdrum compared to the events that Will had been a part of. Naturally, word of the battle with the Calcara had gone round the village like wildfire. An appropriate simile, Will thought as it occurred to him. As he entered the inn with his friends that evening, an expectant hush had fallen over the room, and every eye had turned towards him. He was grateful for the deep cowl on his cloak, which concealed his rapidly reddening features. His three companions sensed his embarrassment. Jenny, as ever, was the quickest to react, and to break the silence that filled the inn. "'Come on, you solemn lot!' she cried to the musicians by the fireplace. "'Let's have some music in here! And some chatter, if you please!' She added the second suggestion with a meaningful glance at the other occupants in the room. The musicians took their cue from her. Jenny was a difficult person to refuse. They quickly struck up a popular local folk tune and the sound filled the room. The other villagers gradually realised that their attention was making Will uncomfortable. They remembered their manners and began talking among themselves again, only occasionally casting glances his way, marvelling that one so apparently young could have been part of such momentous events. The four former wardmates took their seats at a table at the back of the room, where they could talk without interruption. George sends his apologies, Alice said, as they took their seats. He's snowed under with paperwork. The entire scribe school is working day and night. Will nodded his understanding. The impending war with Morgarath and the need to mobilise troops and call in old alliances must have created a mountain of paperwork. So much had happened in the ten days since the battle with the Calcara. Making camp by the ruins, Rodney and Will had tended to the wounds of Baron Arold and Holt, finally settling the two men into a restful sleep. Soon after first light, Abelard trotted into the camp, anxiously searching for his master. Will had only just managed to soothe the horse when a leg-weary Gillen arrived, riding a sway-backed plough horse. The tall ranger gratefully reclaimed Blaze. Then, after being reassured that his former master was in no danger, he set off almost immediately for his own fife, after Will promised to return the plough horse to its owner. Later in the day, Will, Holt, Rodney and Arold had returned to Castle Redmond, where they were all plunged into the non-stop activity of preparing the castle's fighting men for war. There were a thousand and one details to be handled, messages to be delivered and summonses sent out. With Holt still recuperating from his wound, a great deal of this work had fallen to Will. In times like these, he realised, a ranger had little chance for relaxation, which made this evening such a welcome diversion. The innkeeper bustled importantly to their table and set down four glass tankards and a jug of the non-alcoholic beer he brewed from ginger root before them. "'No charge for this table tonight,' he said, we're privileged to have you in our establishment, Ranger. He moved away, calling to one of his serving boys to come and attend the Ranger's table. And be quick smart about it. Alice raised one eyebrow in amazement. Nice to be with a celebrity, she said. Old Skinner usually holds onto a coin so tight the king's head suffocates. Will made a dismissive gesture. People exaggerate things, he said, but Horace leaned forward, his elbows on the table. So, tell us about the fight, he said, eager for details. Jenny looked wide-eyed at Will. I can't believe how brave you were, she said admiringly. I would have been terrified. Actually, I was petrified, Will told them with a rueful grin. The Baron and Sir Rodney were the brave ones. They charged in and took those creatures on at close quarters. I was forty or fifty metres away the whole time. He described the events of the battle, without going into too much detail in his description of the Calcara. They were dead and gone now, he thought, and best forgotten as soon as possible. Some things didn't need dwelling on. 
The three others listened, Jenny wide-eyed and excited, Horace eager for details of the fight, and Alice, calm and dignified as ever, but totally engrossed in his story. As he described his solo ride to summon help, Horace shook his head in admiration. Those ranger horses must be a breed apart, he said. Will grinned at him, unable to resist the jibe that rose to his mind. The trick is staying on them, he said, and was pleased to see a matching grin spread over Horace's face as they both remembered the scene at the Harvest Day Fair. He realised, with a small glow of pleasure, that his relationship with Horace had evolved into a firm friendship, with each viewing the other as an equal. Eager to slip out of the spotlight, he asked Horace how life was progressing in battle school. The grin on the bigger boy's face widened. A lot better these days, thanks to Holt, he said. And, as Will adroitly plied him with more questions, he described life in the battle school for them, joking about his mistakes and shortcomings, laughing as he described the many punishment details he attracted. Will noticed how Horace, once inclined to be boastful and a little arrogant, was far more self-effacing these days. He suspected that Horace was doing better as an apprentice warrior than he let on. It was a pleasant evening, all the more so after the strain and terror of the hunt for the Calcara. As the servers cleared their plates, Jenny smiled expectantly at the two boys. Right, now who's going to have a dance with me? She said brightly, and Will was just too slow in responding, Horace claiming her hand and leading her to the dance floor. As they joined the dancers, Will glanced uncertainly at Alice. He was never quite sure what the tall girl was thinking. He thought that perhaps it might be good manners to ask her to dance as well. He cleared his throat nervously. Ah, oh, <clears throat> would you like to dance too, Alice? He said awkwardly. She favoured him with the barest trace of a smile. Perhaps not, Will. I'm no great shakes as a dancer. I seem to be all legs. In fact... She was an excellent dancer, but, a diplomat to the core, she sensed that Will had only asked her out of politeness. He nodded several times, and they lapsed into silence. But a friendly sort of silence. After some minutes, she turned towards him, placing her chin on her hand to consider him closely. A big day for you tomorrow, she said, and he flushed. He had been summoned to appear before Baron's entire court the following day. I don't know what it's all about, he muttered. Alice smiled at him. He possibly wants to thank you in public, she said. I'm told barons tend to do that to people who've saved their lives. He began to say something, but she laid one soft, cool hand over his, and he stopped. He looked into those calm, smiling grey eyes. Alice had never struck him as pretty, but now he realised that her elegance and grace and those grey eyes, framed by her fine blonde hair, created a natural beauty that far surpassed mere prettiness. Surprisingly, she leaned closer to him and whispered, We're all proud of you, Will, and I think I'm the proudest of all. And she kissed him. Her lips on his were incredibly, indescribably soft. Hours later, before he finally fell asleep, he could still feel them. <laughs>